Now that we have a nuts and bolts understanding of how gender functions as a social construct, we're going to look at how gender operates in our culture on a very broad level. Before we do this, we need to distinguish between gender and sex. Gender and sex are not synonymous, although a number of people treat them as synonyms. Gender is a social construct, as we discussed in the last lecture. And this social construct varies from culture to culture and changes over time. And that's one of the ways that we can prove that gender is, in fact, not universal or stable and something that changes from time period to time period and from place to place. For, so, for instance, I was a late-in-life child for my father. My, do my father had me when he was 56 years old, and he was born in 1920. So the way that gender was normatively organized for my father growing up in 1920 in Philadelphia was vastly different than it was for me growing up in the 70s and 80s in Houston, Texas. The way people dressed, the way men and women courted one another, it was just a completely different gendered world. Sex refers to biological characteristics, although there are many theorists who argue that sex is as much a social construct as gender is. So when we're discussing gender, we're not talking about male or female. We're talking about masculinity, femininity, androgyny, and transgenderism. So masculinity is typically associated with strength, ambition, and emotional control. And boys and men are expected to engage in masculine behaviors. And when boys or men are in a public place and they don't exhibit strength, ambition, or emotional control, let's say that a boy cries at a soccer game, then we have a bunch of people who police the boy's actions, who uh, discipline him for performing femininity in a public setting. So it shames the boy, and he becomes rigidly socialized into masculine gender performance. Conversely, femininity is typically associated with passivity, nurturing, and emotionality. But not everybody fits into the masculine or feminine paradigm. I'm sure that you knew a number of women growing up who fit the tomboy role, or you know, some people who were men who may be a little bit more effeminate. Uh, and these people adopt characteristics of androgyny. Androgynous people reject rigid gender roles and performances. And then the fourth that we're going to discuss is transgendered people. And transgendered people is when their gender identity conflicts with their biology. So they may have been born in the body of a woman, but they feel as if they're a man trapped in a woman's body. Next, we're going to discuss sex. Sex is determined by genitalia, sex organs, and hormones. So it's not necessarily issues of masculinity or femininity. It's kind of you are what you're born with. So if you're a male, your chromosomes have an XY pattern. And if you're female, they have an XX pattern. But this binary between male and female doesn't adequately describe the range of all different types of sexes there are out there. There are a number, a, statist a statistically significant number of people who are born intersexed or have biological characteristics of each. And I should say here that biology definitely influences gender, but it doesn't determine gender expectations, gender roles, and gender performance. So gender is definitely a social construct. A number of different discourses construct and maintain gender identities and expectations. Uh, and in the last lecture, we were talking about when we are being socialized, we have all of these different levels of socialization from primary socialization and secondary socialization to everyday acts of reality maintenance that confirm and sometimes challenge our uh, gendered worlds. So basically, human beings are affiliated with a number of different institutions, and each of these institutions have their own unique discourses that they espouse that help program us for our gendered outlook on the world. 
So some examples of this would be religious discourses. People who are affiliated with specific churches or synagogues, these places of worship will expose their followers to gendered discourses that tell us the appropriate behaviors of men and women. Like in a number of religious discourses, it's women should defer to the judgment of men or marriage is exclusively between a man or a woman depend on what, depending on what's one one's church one goes to. Uh, also, medical discourses. Our doctors and medical experts also help shape our understanding of appropriate gender performance. Legal discourses definitely come into play here. Who should have what opportunities in the job force? Um, and then other discourses and institutions include education. So taking a class like COM412, by the time you leave this class, you're definitely going to have probably some changed opinions about the role of gender in your day-to-day -day life. Media discourses that help shape our understandings of things like sexual harassment or um, the way men and women should look, what the ideals are, and other organizational discourses, like at your place of business, if you work at a restaurant, for example. Sometimes they'll only have men bartending. Um, sometimes uh, they'll only have men as cooks. And whenever a woman is introduced as a cook in the kitchen, she's treated differently. So all of these different institutions and their respective discourses really help mold our perspectives regarding gender in the world. And one of the things about discourse is that discourse makes the normative appear natural. So in a lot of these discourses, we try to make it seem as if, well, this is the way it should be done. And this is the normal way to go about doing things. And this makes gender appear as a natural construct rather than something that is socially constructed. To give you an example of this, we're going to talk about Susan Bordeaux's theory of the tyranny of slenderness as it appears in her book, Unbearable Weight. And one of the arguments that she makes regarding the tyranny of slenderness is that media discourses repeatedly bombard us with images that suggest that women should be underweight. Even though if you look around the United States, there's an obesity epidemic, the average person does not look like a model in a magazine, media discourses suggest that the model is okay, but what the model is supposed to represent is what the problem is. So they make the normative appear natural, normal, and everyday when in fact it's not. So some example of these discourse fragments, uh, I'll review some examples of this discourse fragments that perpetuate this myth. And the reason why I refer to these as discourse fragments is because it's never